So our agenda for today, we'll be covering uh, an introduction to the Aurora Nephilometer, followed by the various options, accessories, and how they can be used with integrating the Nephilometer into your system. We'll then have a section on the aerosol conditioning system, an introduction to that and how it can in integrate with the Aurora Nephilometer. So firstly, introduction to the Aurora Nephilometer. Uh, for those of you who haven't actually dealt with the Aurora Nephilometer, um, these are what the, the main the two variants of the Nephilometer look like. Essentially, it comes in three main variations. The Aurora 1000 is primarily used for visibility, measuring scattering at a single wavelength, usually green for most visibility requirements, but it can also be in the red or blue uh, if it's ordered that way. Then we have the Aurora 3000 and 4000, which are generally used in the more research applications, which uh, the 3000 has three separate wavelengths simultaneously and backscatter, whereas the 4000 adds the ability to uh, have uh, the full scatter as well as 17 extra angles within its measurement cycle. So we'll go into a bit more detail in that. And for all that, I shall pass over to David Logan to give some more detail on how the uh, nephilometer works. Thank you, David. Well, thank you, Grant. It's um, nice to be here, and um, we're going to uh, just, just briefly discuss how nephilometers work in general. Uh, in the aurora, it's uh, the ambient air is transferred into the optical cell where it's illuminated by a, a high-intensity pulsating LED light source. And uh, this light source passes through a, a opal glass diffuser, which gives its unique Lambertian distribution. And the arrangement of the light source with the uh, photomultiplier tube uh, allow the light that's scattering in onto the uh, sample air to um, be detected by the photomultiplier tube, and then it uh, gives us uh, uh, intensity reading in uh, relation to the amount of uh, particulates that are in the uh, optical path there. We also have a backscatter shutter that moves in and out of the optical path of the light source, and that changes the integration angle of the nephilometer. In our uh, measurement cell here, we can see where the light source is in orientation to the there's a reference shutter, the, the photo multiplier tube at the end, and a light trap. And this narrow optical path is where the uh, sample is illuminated, and um, it gives the uh, nephilometer the ability to, to pick up these, these small um, amounts of uh, scattering that are detected there. If we look at the Aurora 3000 and the Aurora 4000, uh, they both have uh, three wavelengths of um, light. There's uh, 450 nanometers, 525 nanometers, and 635 nanometers being the red. But the difference between the two is that the Aurora 3000 has just two angles of scattering uh, for zero or full scattering and 90 degree back scatter, whereas the Aurora uh, 4000, as you can see on this graph, it has uh, 18 different angles that can be uh, selected by the user um, and they can sequentially go through each of those angles measuring the scattering uh, of, of those uh, of the sample there. If we look at the, the light source and the main features of, of our light source there, um, the LED light source has the advantage of being very robust and uh, providing a high reliability. In fact, we uh, guarantee our light source to last for three years, but most last a lot longer than that for sure. Also, the heat generated by the LED light source is uh, a fraction of what is generated by uh, flash lamps that have been used previously. And the other advantage of having an LED light source is that it emits light in a specific wavelength, and uh, so there's no need for additional filters or additional photomultiplier tubes. And also we have a, a servo motor here which precisely moves the uh, backscatter arm into its precise location depending on the measurement the, of uh, uh, integration that you want to, want to complete. 
Well, now we know, since we've known a little bit about how it works, now let's see where the aurora nephilometers are used around the world. Thanks, Grant. Thank you, David. So, nephilometers are used in a, a large number of different applications. I, I guess I'd just like to cover tonight, just very briefly, a, a few different examples of where they they are used at the moment to, to give you an idea of the breadth of application. So the Aurora 1000 is used in a lot of uh, visibility requirements for various environmental pollution authorities around the world. Um, essentially, uh, it measures and reports visibility, usually at that 550 nanometer range. And um, within Australia in particular, there's a standard. So it's used in a number of different states for the local EPA monitoring and reporting, but it is uh, globally used in a number of countries for uh, visibility reporting. Uh, it's not just ground-based. Um, the nephilometer has been incorporated into a few different aeroplanes at different points over the years. Uh, this particular example is, I think, of the one from the UK Met Office. Um, you can see it's been integrated into the into the actual shell of the plane there in the in the front. Um, and in this case, as an example, there when uh, when a number of airlines were shut down with a volcano in Iceland a number of years ago that plane was still able to run and take measurements through some of those plumes, uh, including using the scattering measurements from a nephilometer. So that that nephilometer has been tested to essentially pressures where uh, of the equivalent of flying at an altitude of 15,000 metres. Back on the, on the ground, or more to the point, the ocean, uh, nephilometer has been used on a few different ships. Uh, this particular example here was from the Aquaba campaign in the Mediterranean and the Middle East. But uh, another example here, it, it was on the CSIRO's investigator ship on a trip down to Antarctica. Uh, it's in use in a few different permanent stations in Antarctica. So, I mean, if we're, we're looking at the differences from an aeroplane with very low pressure at high altitude to the freezing cold of uh, Antarctic, the movement of a ship, uh, clearly the nephilometer can run in a number of different locations and under quite significant different levels of measurement uh, conditions. Another application that's typically used is uh, for dust storm. Uh, and in, in particular, the Gobi Desert, there's a lot of dust storms move across China, so there's a whole monitoring network there, which is an early warning uh, system. Uh, provides details of visibility, but also helps for asset protection and uh, climate research. So they've expanded that network for, for those sort of things. Um, typically around the world, in areas where there is a dust storm, most filter-based measurement systems fall apart as the filter gets loaded and you stop getting measurements. The nephilometer can read some very high measurements for quite a period of time. It might need a clean out the next time somebody's out there, but you'll continue to get readings of scattering uh, well after most instruments have stopped reading in a, in a dust storm. Another application here in a more pristine environment. So the, uh, this is an example of the nephilometers uh, uh, sampling from various elevations on a, in the Amazon Tall Tower Observatory. Um, uh, again, it, it's uh, <laughs> the story there is more interesting as to how the instruments get out into the middle of the Amazon and that side of things. But uh, again, the, the nephilometer is a relatively rugged instrument. The aurora nephilometer has been used in, in a number of high altitude stations in the Himalayas, the Andes, the Alps. Uh, so generally these, these applications are often above the planetary boundary layer, so they're pretty pristine environment. But on occasion with things like a sub-Saharan dust episode where you get uh, winds blowing particulate from Africa up over the Alps in Europe, uh, you can certainly see the change in composition when you're using the three wavelength aspects of the nephilometer to, to look at the source of um, those particulates. So given I've given you just a touch of some of the applications for the aurora, it, it should be pretty clear that there's a number of different requirements as to how that might be integrated. So I'd like to pass over to David to go through the various options and accessories we have uh, available to assist with that. Thanks, Grant. Uh, well, there are a number of uh, options available for the Aurora Nephilometer, but when you're deciding to, to purchase a Nephilometer, you need to decide, well, what is your application? So for the Aurora 3000, your, your application might be for full scatter and backscatter measurements for aerosol research, uh, or you might need uh, data to assist in the calculation of a single scatter albedo and also aerosol and symmetry factor. For more advanced, calculations and, uh, and 
measurements. The Royal 4000 uh, gives you the opportunity to uh, uh, assist in calculations of optical depth and also uh, the phase function. Also, another unique uh, feature of the Aurora 4000 is the possibility to correct for the truncation error within the nephilometer. Another question you need to consider is, well, what is your environment? Is it a pristine environment uh, like in the Antarctica or is it a densely populated environment where particular levels could be quite high? Or is it a remote location where maybe you just need solar power or, or minimum power consumption as possible? Or are you in integrating it into a, a large research station uh, where it might be operating with a number of other uh, aerosol related uh, research instruments? There's also the opportunity, uh, maybe you're using it in a, like we saw in aircrafts or uh, some other situations which uh, you may need a high level of reliability. And also if you're using it with the, in conjunction with the aerosol conditioning system, well, we're going to discuss that a little bit later also. So let's firstly look, look at the standard Aurora 3000 and 4000 configuration. Uh, this is a standalone uh, situation where the sample inlet is drawn into the cell through its internal sample pump. Uh, it's just a low power blower motor. It has uh, 5 to 15 litres per minute. But unfortunately that flow is not regulated or controlled. So restrictions in the inlet can affect your uh, flow. But it is good for low power consumption. And also the uh, calibration gas is vented out the inlet as well as out of the exhaust. This is the simplest configuration. If you're in an environment maybe where you're connecting in uh, parallel with other instruments for uh, aerosol monitoring, um, where they have their own fixed flows and you don't want to contaminate them, then you could use the automated ball valve option, which uh, can be fitted to the Aurora uh, uh, nephilometers. And what this uh, option does is during sample, it allows the, the sample to go through the cell and vents out the exhaust. It uses an external pump and it has a fixed flow of uh, four and a half liters per minute. And then during calibration, well, the inlet flow doesn't change. It just is bypassed out to the exhaust pump, whereas the calibration gas internally uh, goes through the cell and then it vents out the other uh, ball valve. So that way there's no contamination in your inlet. Uh, with the other instruments there. So it's good for use in applications where you're sharing a common inlet with other instruments. This option can also be uh, retrofitted into existing instruments or it can be um, fitted uh, in your instrument when it's new in the factory. It also requires an external pump and we've got some more information on that uh, at the end of our presentation in a special offer. Also, uh, to step up a bit further, you could have the MFC and ball valve option. This is basically the same as the ball valve option, whereas it, internally there's a mass flow controller installed, which is programmed and controlled by the Aurora nephilometer itself through the front menu. And you can set your flow between uh, zero or 10 liters, or you can have zero to 20 liter mass flow uh, if you desire. This uh, option can only be, be factory fitted, but it's, it's very good for situations where you've got to match up your flows with other instruments where you're using a common common inlet in your system. And here's a, a picture of an example of an instrument we uh, set up. It was a Aurora 4000. It was designed to go into the fuselage of an aircraft. We had to test it up to 15,000 meters uh, using our um, pressure chamber to simulate those conditions. And we uh, made the case a bit smaller. It just shows how Ecotec can uh, provide a, the right solution for uh, whatever your research uh, campaign may be. So we're going to look at start data storage and collection, and we might hand over to Grant now for that. Thank you, David. So obviously a key part in, in using any instrumentation is to be able to collect and use that data. So Ecotec has a couple of different options to be able to uh, do so. The nephilometer has been designed so that uh, our Eridis software can collect directly 
from it. it uh, essentially, there's a, a free version that comes with the Nephilometer and the more advanced version that uh, lets you do a few more automated things. But essentially, you can collect directly from the Nephilometer or if you've got multiple things you're wanting to log, potentially the Congrego data logger can talk straight to the various Nephilometers and then to Aridis. And in the example there on the screen, we can see the traces from one of the polar Nephilometers at a whole stack of different angles. You can see there's a whole heap of different data and obviously increasing as you get greater uh, total intensity, but we've got a few different options there to be able to communicate with both the Nephilometer and whatever other instruments you may need in the system. Uh, David's covered a number of the different options. There's a, a list here and it's a, in the Ecotech brochure which can be downloaded from our website. There's a full list of the different options and what which nephilometers they're applicable to. Um, there's also a list if you noted there was a, a few different references to papers. There's a full bibliography link within the uh, at the website to also uh, view those various paper, the details if you're wanting to look at uh, pa um, papers. There's a lot more than we can cover in, in this presentation obviously. So one other, you could call it an accessory, you could call it a, a measurement, a, a, a system to work with our nephilometer, is the aerosol conditioning system. And uh, I'd like to pass back to David to go into some more detail on the aerosol conditioning system. Thanks, Grant. So the hydroscopic properties of atmospheric aerosols are an important parameter to assess in order to accurately model the effects of aerosols in the Earth's radiative balance. So when certain aerosols are exposed to high humidity conditions, they appear to grow in size and the amount of growth depends on the composition and the, the size of the particular aerosols. And this can be uh, measured uh, by exposing the aerosol to different levels of humidity and then measuring its scattering properties. So we might have two instruments in parallel. One measures the dry, un, uh, unaffected uh, aerosols and the other can measure the scattering properties of a, uh, a wet or a humidified sample. Uh, and the scattering light uh, enhancement factor uh, is attained by dividing the uh, wet scattering by the dry scattering measurement. And the ACS can do this uh, by simultaneously controlling uh, two channels, a wet channel and a dry channel. Uh, with the uh, ACS 1000 aerosol conditioning system. And what it's able to do is it, it can control the, uh, the wet channel to different levels of humidity whilst maintaining the dry uh, at a level usually lower than 40% uh, humidity. And then it can control the, the flows of uh, both channels. And then at the end of the uh, bottom of the ACS, you can connect two aerosol monitoring instruments such as the aurora nephilometers and there you can uh, measure the scattering properties and and calculate the hydroscopic growth of the aerosols in real time just looking at the inside of the uh, nephilometer not the nephilometer sorry the uh, aerosol conditioning system uh, it's made of um, stainless steel electro polished stainless steel and the inner diameter is uh, uh, quite a large 41 millimeters so that uh, makes sure that there's a minimum of loss particle loss through the, the system and also allows plenty of time for the aerosols to take up uh, the water vapor and to, to change in their, their size and state through the system each um, each system can be easily connected or re reconfigured depending on the uh, type of measurement that you want to do also, at the top of the ACS, there's a motorized ball valve which can bypass the uh, sample of your inlet, uh, bypass it uh, away from the nephilometers and the ACS so that you can perform maintenance without uh, affecting any other instruments that are in the system. Some of the main components of the ACS 1000 is its uh, main front panel. There it's got a LCD and a keypad so you can um, set up points and sequences so you can uh, program your humidigrams uh, for whatever, whatever period of uh, time that you like. It's made of a anodized aluminium rack which can be uh, which is modular so it can be pulled apart for, for easy transportation and it also has adjustable shelving so that it can be um, suited for different types of uh, aerosol instruments. 
There's also three mass flow controllers on the ACS-1000. Two of them are to control the wet and dry channels, and one is to control the uh, dry purge air for the dryers. If you're using uh, Aurora nephilometers in, as you can see in the bottom of the, this illustration here, uh, the, the flow for these is controlled by the ACS, and it comes, the ACS comes with its own external vacuum pump for this. So when you're configuring the ACS, you have a number of different modules. Uh, there's the humidifier module is, is one module that uh, you'll need, and that module is uh, what is used to control the humidity of your sample. For example, you can see here on this inner tube, our, our dry sample comes into the humidifier. It passes through a Gore-Tex membrane, and on the outside of that membrane, there's a water reserve of high purity water. And this water is heated and the amount of heat uh, generated into that water uh, controls the amount of water vapour that is transferred through the membrane and into the, the sample in the inner tube, hence it's humidifying your sample. At the bottom of the tube, there's a precision temperature and humidity sensor, which uh, is fed back to the microprocessor and we can accurately control each point of uh, humidity uh, that you want to set in your, your program. For the dryer module, that sort of works in the opposite way with a similar size to the humidifier. Um, the inner tube is covered with a Nafion membrane, and then on the outside of that membrane is a, uh, a purge air, a dry, dry purge air, which uh, removes the moisture from the sample of the uh, going into the inlet. Once again, there's a precision temperature and humidity sensor at the bottom of the uh, dryer to, to measure its humidity as it comes out. In some situations where the environment is very humid, you may need additional dryers. So this is a more cost effective dryer that can be put in series with the other ACS dryers to uh, increase the amount of uh, drying efficiency of your system. As well as the uh, other modules, we have uh, an extender module which uh, doesn't do much, it's just a solid tube, but it, it extends the, the length of the, uh, the path for both channels so that the uh, sample, when it reaches the nephilometer uh, on your wet and dry side, uh, is the sample path is the same. So they both reach at the same time. So when you're calculating your uh, enhancement factor, you know you're using data that's uh, in the same uh, time frame. There's also a flow splitter which divides the inlet flow into two, the two channels for your, your wet and dry. Um, and this is designed to, for minimal particle loss. At the bottom of the ACS, there's the uh, instrument rack, which is uh, an optional accessory, and that's designed to house uh, comfortably house two Aurora nephilometers. But you can also adjust the shelves, and you could fit other aerosol type instruments in there as well, maintaining a high flexibility for the system. Some other accessories that you'll, you'll need is a, um, uh, for the dryers, you need low dew point air. So uh, Ecotec has a, a low dew point air source, which can provide a minus 40 degree uh, dew point air um, at about 10 liters per minute. So that'll maximize the efficiency of your aerosol dryers. Uh, you're also going to need some sort of inlet, whether you already have one, it might be an existing manifold or it might be um, a, a TSB type inlet. And you're also going to need a source of high purity water. Now, maybe you ha already have that in your laboratory, um, or you can uh, get something like a milliq water system or a millipore system for your water generation. Data collection, well, similar to what Grant mentioned before, you could use the Congrego. That's the best option. So you can collect data simultaneously from uh, your two auroras, your wet and dry, as well as your ACS. So it's got the humidity data. Uh, feed it into the Congrego, and in real time, you can calculate your scattering enhancement factors um, and then report it very nicely in, in uh, using Eridus there. And around the globe, there's quite a few installations of the aerosol conditioning system. Um, some are permanent, some have been used in short term trials. An example of this is uh, one in Beijing with the Remote Sensing Institute of China, where they're using the ACS 
uh, to assist with uh, satellite measurements. Same with uh, NRSC in India, where they um, use it to co co correlating uh, ground station data with satellite data. And a lot of other uh, systems have been installed uh, and operated here in Australia and uh, in uh, Finland and, and Switzerland. Uh, this is some papers. Uh, you can find them on the website that uh, Grant mentioned before. Uh, if you want to get more details of those. I'll hand back to Grant now. So in summary today, we've uh, covered an introduction to the Aurora Nephilometer. We said where on earth it's used, given a number of different examples of the variety of particular applications and uh, conditions it runs in, the principles of op the, the basic principles of operation, how the various options and accessories that are available to make integration to your needs a lot easier or uh, also covered the aerosol conditioning system, provided details on, on what that basically is and, and how it integrates with the Aurora. Remembering that it, it essentially controls two samples in parallel. You can have a wet and a dry or all sorts of different combinations that you as the researcher can change around what the order is and change your, you know, for different studies, you may want to, to condition the sample differently. It can be set to do humidigrams. You can set a number of different points. It's, it's highly controllable uh, from a, a simple user interface and it, it can be used certainly ideally with our nephilometer, but it has certainly been in, uh, used as well for other instruments in an aerosol basis where you're wanting to look at the impacts of different levels of humidity and the, the impact on uh, different properties of aerosols. Uh, certainly what's next, you can uh, contact us on the email there, you can visit our website, a really good spot if you're specifically looking for details on the Aurora or the ACS or any of those papers is to visit www.ecotech.com slash Aurora.